Thank you, President Steth, and congratulations to you and the entire North Carolina team on securing the IES grant. It certainly amplifies and affirms North Carolina's national leadership and the system's effort to be first in affordability and accessibility in North Carolina for North Carolina students, a model for diversity, and an economic driver for the state. I certainly building an intentionally designed dual enrollment strategy, the focus of my remarks this morning fuels the attainment of that aspiration. And I'm pleased to be back in North Carolina, back in North Carolina for so many reasons. There are 12 active North Carolina community colleges in achieving the dream and several are leader colleges. Some like Durham Tech joined ATD in 2004, the year that we were founded and others like Halifax just joined the network this year as part of our new work to build rural college resiliency. ATD is also a proud partner with the Belk Center and I'm honored to serve there as the chair of its national advisory board. I wanna thank Catherine and Michelle for the invitation to speak. I know hostings like this are challenging, especially in this virtual environment. So I especially wanna uh, say thank you to you and also to the planning committee uh, for the design of uh, the next two days events. And of course, I want to thank uh, Nick Mathern from the ATD team. He is our K through 12 uh, subject matter expert on the team and he's been instrumental in helping me to prepare uh, for today's remarks. Part of the ATD way elevates, amplifies and centers the student voice in all that we do. So meet Marcus. Marcus relocated to Pottstown, Pennsylvania from another state in the South. He had been in a fight in his previous school coming to the defense of another boy and he suffered multiple stab wounds and was expelled for his involvement in the fight. When he arrived in Pottstown, his school record made it very difficult for him to enroll in high school. That along with a very difficult home life led Marcus to give up on school and to give up on himself. However, Marcus was referred through a fully accidental connection to the Gateway to College program at my former institution, Montgomery County Community College. In the orientation session, Kema Sheriff, uh, then Assistant Dean of uh, Student Programs, made the same commitment to Marcus that she made to all potential Gateway to College students. She said, I can't change what happens when you are away from campus and I can't take away the pain. But if you show up here every day, we will create a different reality for you. Ultimately, Marcus trusted the message. Even though he lived far away from the college campus, uh, he often walked to campus or rode his bike, and he was still facing significant challenges in his home. The difference was that he felt like he belonged at the college. He became an ambassador for the program. And here's a photo of me with Marcus on the day he earned his high school diploma while simultaneously earning credits toward college through, through the Gateway to College program. The message here to start off is that we have, uh, there's an imperative in front of us to design our dual enrollment and early college models to serve more learners like Marcus so that the pathway into these programs are not accidental, and so that the pathways through the programs are designed with intention as, as parts of and connected to the larger system within which our colleges rest. Let me share a little bit about achieving the dream and the values that drive our work and what we're learning about the arc of the student success movement and how dual enrollment fits. So ATD was founded in 2004, uh, many of you know our work. You've been deeply involved in it. We were the first national nonprofit working to build the capacity of our nation's community colleges to improve student outcomes, to transform their lives, and in turn, transform their communities. More than 300 colleges in 45 states are part of the network, and our work touches more than 500 community colleges through partnerships with state student success centers, 
partnerships with entities like the Belk Center in North Carolina and many, many more. Colleges that are part of our network champion equity. This is an excerpt from Achieving the Dream's current equity statement, a statement that we are now revising and will soon put out an updated statement to the field. But this is an important excerpt because it articulates what our colleges commit to when they join Achieving the Dream. We expect them to dismantle barriers for students traditionally underserved by our education systems. And we require them to, dismant to, to disaggregate their data to identify and address equity gaps for economically marginalized and racially minoritized students, as well as for students with intersecting identities, first generation, veteran status, gender, age, et cetera. And then we support them as they move to action to implement evidence-based whole college practices and redesign systems that change the trajectory of student outcomes. And we do this by uh, focusing on core fundamentals. This is what sets, I think, ATD apart in the field. We understand that building capacity in these seven areas are absolutely essential for colleges to begin to move toward this systemic, intentional design of their work and their practice. The equity uh, capacity here is one of the seven capacities, but I will also say that it courses through out every other of the six capacities. So it is not an or, it's an and. And in fact, you could also move equity into the middle of the circle and create a student-focused, equitably designed culture, which is really where we are moving as a field. So ATD colleges are making impressive gains, aggregate gains in student completion, and many are seeing an increase in overall completion and the elimination of equity gaps. That's happening with our most successful colleges. For successful colleges share four commonalities. I, and I think these are really important as we begin to think about the intentional design of dual enrollment and the connection of that work to our whole college transformation work. Successful colleges focus on those fundamentals and they know that focus is enduring. It is a constant. You don't complete the fundamental building and move to the next stage of work, you're doing the fundamental uh, building in a cycle that's continuous. The second thing is that they adopt an organizing framework uh, for their work. Sometimes that's guided pathways, sometimes that's the lost momentum framework. Many of you are familiar with some of the frameworks that, that we're using in the field, but they're organizing all of their work around a framework that connects individual inter interventions into a system-wide systemic approach uh, to change. The third thing is that they're adopting their own unique theory of change. So some will focus on teaching and learning, others are focusing on holistic student supports, but there is a certain point of view that an institution has about what is that lever that will drive scaled gains at their institution. The enrollment could be one of those scaled levers. And then lastly, the leaders and the institutions move with pace and a sense of ur urgency. You know, for many in our network, the gains are falling short. And I believe dual enrollment can no longer sit as a siloed activity. Success in redesigning and connecting dual enrollment to our overall work fuels our movement along the arc of the student success effort, which looks like this. Uh, so many of our, we focused on student completion as a field and we're beginning to think about what are the student economic gains of that focus and then what are the community gains of that focus. Uh, but there are other pieces of this evolving uh, strategy. That includes thinking differently, and I'll call it a phase zero, uh, about access. And to me, the dual enrollment piece fits clearly into that maybe phase zero, and then courses through phase one, phase two, and phase three. Uh, so hopefully this helps you kind of frame and see that this is not an effort just on student completion. It's a much larger uh, effort uh, to transform our colleges and in turn transform our communities by focusing on those pathways into and through our colleges. So I know that this audience understands the enormous economic and educational challenges that our country faces. 
as context, let's just look at wages and educational attainment and what that might mean for our work. The 2019 Brookings Institute report found that more than 53 million people, that's 44% of all workers between the ages of 18 and 64 are low wage, meaning they earn hourly wages of $10.22 and median annual earnings of $17,950. These workers are disproportionately female and both black and Latinx workers are overrepresented relative to their share of the total workforce. The pay gaps are more significant and widening for racially minoritized workers, according to the Economic Policy Institute. And while the economy appears to be on the recovery, historically recoveries have been uneven and often widen existing inequities, with educational attainment being a particular driver. For example, the Georgetown University Center for Economic for Education and the Workforce in the recovery period just after the Great Recession, found that workers with at least some college education or a degree captured 11.5 million of the 11.6 million net new jobs created during the recovery. So just think about that and the implications for college credit attainment uh, for the students that we're working with. Degree attainment continues to be an area where we see the largest equity gaps. And COVID exacerbated these gaps, exposing our nation's health and economic inequalities as the pandemic and the resulting economic fallout hit working class families and racialized minority communities, most of those we serve disproportionately. And I offer this context because too often when we think about individual programs or initiatives, whether that is dual enrollment, or career and technical programs, or developmental education, and notice the silos in that description, we think about them as discrete and narrow educational programs, rather than as powerful strategic levers that can systematically, and strate if strategically integrated, help our institution institutions address persistent and systemic economic and racial inequities. I know that we believe that education is a key lever to addressing social economic inequalities. And very much of the work that has led to the expansion of dual enrollment has been grounded in this very idea that we need to find a way to accelerate opportunity for more students. But the reality is that as an education system and particularly for those of us who work in sectors founded to serve those students uh, who are most in need, we still have more significant work to do, particularly in terms of ensuring that our efforts are leading to more equitable social and economic mobility and addressing persistence, persistent wage and wealth gaps. As Anthony Carnival, who heads up the Georgetown Center recently wrote, because of its new prominence in American economic life, higher education has also become the capstone in an education system that's a primary cause of the reproduction of race and class privilege across generations. And he goes on to say that today's post-secondary education and training system has become a new gear wheel, arguably the biggest gear wheel in the American race and class inequality machine. Post-secondary education and training mimics and magnifies the inequality that it inherits from the pre-K through 12 system. And it then projects this inequality into the labor markets, the housing markets, and local school districts, guaranteeing the intergenerational transmission of race and class privilege. Dual enrollment, well-designed, I think, can disrupt this gear wheel. Let's go back to a student, Janae Parker. Janae is a 2018 Dream Scholar who testified before the US House Committee on Education and Labor two years ago about her experience as a single parent student struggling with poverty, housing and food insecurity, working two to three part-time jobs, 
while pursuing her dream of a college education. And that trajectory included many stops and starts at multiple institutions. And she testified, I remember thinking that these problems were my fault. I thought that this was happening, this stopping and starting out because I had made bad choices or was not trying hard enough. But then she realized her experience was not unique, that thousands of students were struggling to pursue higher education, which made her wonder, are we all not just, are we all just not cut out for college? Have we all done something wrong? And I suggest to you that the answer to Janae's question is an emphatic no. No, we, we are wrong. We are designed, just as Tony Carnival suggests, to get the student results we're getting, including in our dual enrollment programs. Clearly those designs must change. We have to begin to interrogate, interrogate existing structures, practices, policies, that, and take overt action to dismantle historic structures and practices that have disadvantaged racialized minorities and first-generation students uh, and others. So where do we begin? Where do we begin to interrogate dual enrollment? And what actions can we take to really strengthen it to create more equitable opportunities for our students and in turn build up our communities. Well, let's dig back into the context around, around our work and dual enrollment. You know, we've heard a lot lately about learning loss uh, across the educational spectrum, and that clearly is a concern. But we can't address learning loss if we don't address the fact that significant percentages of students have disengaged from education in full. So we know that the pandemic has increased the disconnection rate. That is Americans between the ages of 16 and 24 who are neither employed or in school. That's risen to 28%. That's 10 million disconnected Americans between the ages of 16 and 24. They reside in your communities. It's hard to find these disconnected students. Uh, but finding them is important. One recent survey suggests that fully one quarter of high school graduates postponed college last year. That contributes to this disconnection rate. And of course, this has had a tremendous impact on the enrollments at our community colleges, which, which I know uh, you are deeply familiar with. And there have been severe declines uh, in students enrolled in dual enrollment programs of nearly 3% this spring, according to the National Student Clearinghouse. In terms of a pipeline, we know that thousands of students in our K through 12 systems also dropped out during the pandemic or lost progress due to a host of challenges from physical and mental health um, barriers to family supports to technology barriers and more. Even before the pandemic, our approach to access required us to revisit it and take serious action. I, 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 before the pandemic, I was calling for something I called a bold new access agenda in many of our ATD convenings, an agenda that's focused on finding and serving the students who need us most and not assuming that access is in our DNA because of the nature of our mission as community colleges. Dual enrollment, ro enrollment fully reimagined is a key part of this dual, of this new bold uh, access agenda. Pre-pandemic, dual enrollment was the fastest growing segment of the community college population, accounting for one in seven community college enrollments nationally, somewhat masking the underlying enrollment decline that many of our institutions were already facing before COVID. In North Carolina, as you know, you saw similar gains with total enrollment in the Career and College Promise Program increasing nearly 20,000 students between the between 2016-17 and 2020-2021. Despite this growth and the promise that dual enrollment truly holds, CCRC, the Community College Research Center, points out that rather than advance equitable college outcomes, the typical approach to dual enrollment tends to reinforce inequities due to inequitable access to these programs 
for racially minoritized and poverty impacted students and families. Four out of every five school districts have racial equity gaps in access to dual enrollment. And here's a state by state map uh, that CCRC has produced that illustrates those gaps. Let's look at the areas of uh, purple and an even deeper purple across the country. North Carolina has faced similar challenges. According to research by Sarah Deal at the Belk Center, CCP students who participate in the college transfer pathway are more likely to be female, white, speak English at home, and to have a higher high school GPA, while those in the career and technical education pathway are more likely to be Black or Latinx, economically disadvantaged, and to speak Spanish at home. As the CCRC researchers point out, now is the time to flip the script on dual enrollment programs uh, to change the gear wheel uh, from programs of privilege or random acts of dual enrollment to programs that expand college opportunity for students and build back enrollments for colleges. So flipping the script, changing, disrupting the gear wheel, I offer this new agenda for dual enrollment that fits in four categories. The first is a data-driven, culturally responsive design and outreach strategy. To realize the potential of dual enrollment, we need to focus on closing equity gaps by intentionally reaching out to racially minoritized and economically marginalized students and communities who currently do not see dual enrollment as a pathway or actually have no, no access to dual enrollment as a pathway because they face significant participation barriers and awareness barriers. ATD has always been focused on the use of data analysis to identify those equity gaps and that same methodology can be used by our colleges to identify gaps in access to dual enrollment and in success in dual enrollment in aggregate and by program. And that program piece is really important when we match up participation in certain programs to labor market value. Our Gateway to College program offers lessons on this type of focused outreach. Program staff deliberately seek out students who are out of school, who have a GPA below 2.0, or who are behind in, in uh, credits for their age. Students who were previously unsuccessful in high school establish a new identity, a new identity as successful college students through a combination of dual enrollment and personalized coaching. We can also learn from culturally specific college bridge programs, like the Avenza program at Central Oregon Community College. This program combines dual enrollment courses during multiple years of high school, along with a summer bridge experience that integrates leadership, college preparation, and culturally relevant themes to encourage Latinx youth to graduate from high school and pursue higher education. Alumni of this program as well as the Good Road, the college's counterpart program for Native youth, report a strong sense of belonging on the college campus after they graduate high school, and they enroll as full-time college credits. The uniqueness of both of these programs is that they are hosted, Gateway and Avenza, on the college campus. There are other examples. The CCRC and Aspen Institute's Dual Enrollment Playbook uh, highlights work in three states, Florida, Ohio, and Washington. Indian River State College in Florida, for example, analyzed disaggregated data and found that while Black and Latinx students were succeeding, once they accessed the program, succeeding in dual enrollment at similar rates as other students, these students were not as aware of the college's dual enrollment offerings or how to receive the help they needed to take advantage of the offerings. This prompted the college to coordinate more closely with school districts and high schools on how they could jointly address participation gaps for Black and Latinx students, to work with community-based organizations to increase awareness of dual enrollment in low-income Black neighborhoods and hosting a men of color event for high school students, and to consider strategies to better connect dual enrollment with the IGNITE program, a transfer pathway 
with Florida A&M University, a historically black college and university. These types of intentional and data-driven efforts are essential to closing equity gaps. The second, the second strategy uh, to the bold new uh, dual enrollment agenda is to remove barriers to students and provide holistic student supports. Second, to deliver on this transformational power of dual enrollment, our outreach must make clear that the opportunity to take college courses is paired, is paired, strategically paired with services that students need to engage with education as they move along the dual enrollment pathway. Traditionally, students who enroll in dual enrollment programs, think about it, are already on track they're making good academic progress, and they have support systems in place to navigate the academic and logistical requirements of the programs. Consequently, many dual enrollment programs and, and some early college programs are often seen as exclusionary or programs of privilege rather than inclusionary. The path to success for design requires that we grade these holistic student supports into our thinking about dual enrollment, that we just not think about the courses or the pathways uh, for dual enrollment, but we think about the braided holistic student supports and they are co-designed along the way. Our Gateway to College program illustrates how community colleges put these principles to life to support young people with significant barriers to attaining uh, post-secondary degrees and credentials. Eight-way programs adapt to their unique communities, but of the model features specific strategies to remove barriers that, and support the whole student. These include eliminating financial barriers such as tuition, textbook expenses, or transportation and meal expenses, providing personalized academic supports, success coaches, learning communities, academic labs, tutoring sessions, many of which are program specific and are concurrent with the delivery of the courses, connecting students to a wide range of additional services from healthcare to clothing, to food pantries, to housing assistance, to mental health supports and services, and building students' self-efficacy skills to identify needs and solutions and ensure a smooth transition to further higher education. The key is the integration and personalized nature of these services. As Miranda Hayes, who graduated from Pueblo Community College's Gateway program in 2018 puts it, Gateway doesn't treat you like a number on a spreadsheet. They got to know me as a person. Their ability to connect you as a student and connect to others is, is so unique. It inspired us to work hard and graduate. Third, we need to think about dual enrollment, not just as an academic ende endeavor for individual students, but as a community building effort. A key question to, us, to assess our dual enrollment programs is, who are the members of the community who are not currently assessing higher education? So I've made a case through this narrative that it's important that we get to know the students that we're serving. Um, and ATD just released a, a wonderful guide on understanding your student, but I'm also making a case that it's equally important to understand who's missing from our campuses and why. And what supports do those students need to feel welcome and successful at our colleges? There's a companion question that is equally important. Who are the community-based organizations who work with those who are currently uh, not in higher education? And how can we connect those organizations to our work in a mutually beneficial way, win-win partnerships to encourage more students to participate in dual enrollment and higher education? And this obviously starts with ensuring strong partnerships between K through 12 and community colleges, which is why we have so many uh, K through 12 practitioners uh, involved in, in this event over the next two days. We know at ATD that these partnerships are essential. Uh, we're working on a K through 12 partnership landscape analysis, which 
provides our colleges with a thorough understanding of the K through 12 partnership uh, pipeline, looks at gaps and recommends a roadmap to build, scale and optimize equitable K through 12 partnerships that can lead to more successful dual enrollment design and other pre-college programs. But we also know that there are others in our community that we need to look to. We need to build stronger employer connections who, and, and those employer connections can also uh, support stronger dual enrollment design. I think that's part of our role uh, in pipeline building in our communities. With that employer engagement, I see really new opportunities emerging for work-based learning and scaling work-based learning within the designs of our dual enrollment uh, programs. And that being at the core of, of shaping those part, new partnerships with employers. In Massachusetts, Holyoke Public Schools and Holyoke Community College operate an early college with three academies that each partner with employers, offering work-based learning and opportunities at hospitals, museums, social service agencies, public safety agencies, and radio stations. And additionally, after COVID, crashed plans for Holyoke's Gateway to College program to operate a summer jobs uh, program. They hosted 20 employers from 10 different fields for a virtual work-based learning experience, which led the program to provide greater access to coursework matching student careers, career goals. We also need to partner with community-based organizations who are seen as trusted messengers by many in our communities. They can help promote our programs, facilitate personalized introductions to the college for students who might otherwise not see a place for themselves in higher education. At Portland Community College, a student success coach attends staff meetings of a local nonprofit that serves foster youth and young people experiencing homelessness. And through that collaboration, young people are invited into a coaching relationship with the college that leads to their participation in dual enrollment courses. And that same coach, that same coach maintains relationships with caseworkers from the Department of Human Services and the county's juvenile justice division to extend the opportunity for dual enrollment courses to young people served by those agencies. You see that being that, that intentional design in both of those examples from Holyoke and from Portland. Fourth and finally, we must address what researchers at CCRC describe as random acts of dual enrollment, where students take courses based on availability rather than on how those courses align with their plans or a means to explore academic and career interests and develop an educational plan aligned with their talents and interests. Having been a community college president for 15 years and working strategically to build uh, our dual enrollment strategy, which did include the Gateway to College program and started as this random acts of dual enrollment approach where we basically responded to the school district's needs for certain courses and not this, not, did not design around student pathways. I fully understand the temptation uh, to take this, what is perceived to be this responsive approach rather than this more strategic approach. But we have to ensure that our students are not simply taking college courses, but are participating in dual enrollment as that first step in our guided pathways effort, which is either getting on the path or at least finding the right path. And we need to ensure that those, that those courses are going to lead to meaningful and productive college credit over the course of the student's post-secondary experience. Enrollment in college courses, including dual enrollment courses, doesn't come without risk to students. Some students are paying for these dual enrollment courses and expecting that they will transfer and carry with them into a program of study, either at the community college and then through the community college into a baccalaureate institution. And many of our excess credit issues, frankly, as a field, begin with poorly designed dual enrollment. To gather research on how to support these efforts, ATD has just launched a regional professional learning communities to develop aligned pathways for students from high school to college to local workforce and career opportunities. We're working with four colleges and they're bringing together high school educators, community college faculty, 
workforce development professionals and leaders and community-based organizations and employers into learning communities. Mott Community College in Flint, Michigan is working to strengthen STEM pathways by removing barriers to high school students earning college credits. Tyler Junior College in Tyler, Texas is bringing its entire computer networking and IT pathway to local high schools. Tyler has recovered lost CTE dual enrollments by bringing several CTE certificate programs to local high school campuses. I can't, uh, I can't stop without talking about in a broad way some policy implications of our work. And I know over the next two days, you will have some of these policy conversations. I focus mostly on institutional and programmatic issues because that's where, that's what we can control. Uh, that's where we can make the most impact in strengthening our dual enrollment programs. That focus on institutional transformation, you know, aligns with ATD's philosophy that, that uh, no matter what state policies and federal policies are put in place to support student success and equitable student success, uh, that work will not succeed without institutional transformation also happening at the same time. But I do wanna make a couple of brief points about state and federal policy because they really do uh, influence the work on the ground. First, we know from research at CCRC that participation in dual enrollment and outcomes for those students vary significantly by state and that states and institutions themselves need to improve their data on dual enrollment students. Uh, ATD needs to improve uh, its data support around dual enrollment students. We need to help you to do that kind of on the ground work around your dual enrollment students. And given the need for more equitable access to these programs, we need better disaggregated data by race, ethnicity, income, and other student characteristics. This of course is also a problem at the federal level as the Department of Education does not consistently collect a good data on dual enrollment, although it appears that changes are on the way to IPEDS to correct this gap. Uh, and as ATD moves forward with its uh, work with the post-secondary post data partnership, dual enrollment uh, data is, is an important part of what we're looking at, as well as collecting other information like student parent status that's currently missing. There's a lot of gaps in our, in our data system. There are policies that impact equity in dual enrollment and many states have established programs and policies that provide funding to cover the cost of dual enrollment programs, which dramatically increases the scale and the benefit, the benefits of dual enrollment. However, in many instances, the same policies feature eligibility requirements which may exclude the very students who could benefit most from the opportunity. So when you think about interrogating policies and practices from an equity perspective, interrogating those eligibility requirements to see who's being left out is really important as we think about this dual enrollment work in the future. As the Education Commission on the States has reported, by and large, state set eligibility requirements limit dual enrollment access to only the most academically advanced students who are likely to pursue college after high school regardless. However, many of your colleagues and state agencies and legislative bodies understand these paradoxes and they are working to improve access for students who need it. Uh, there are good examples in Ohio and Illinois and in some states, uh, COVID has uh, prompted agencies to replace Accuplacer, for example, uh, with other me measures such as transcript evaluations or GPA uh, as an eligibility requirement. And that's opened the door for more students to participate in dual enrollment. And at the federal level, we need to rethink how our student aid policies are impacting dual enrollment, particularly for economically marginalized students in states that do not provide free or discounted access to dual enrollment courses. In the past year, the unprecedented levels of funding unlocked by COVID relief packages really have come with uh, remarkable flexibility. And the US Department of Education has indicated that states may use multiple sources of relief funds to support dual enrollment. 
and early college, and some already are. Many of these decisions about the use of funds are happening at the local level with discretion left to college presidents and superintendents. And as practitioners, you are in the perfect position to use your voice and call on your leaders to leverage those resources to grant access to more students whose academic trajectory can be changed through dual enrollment. I'm a big fan of strategic planning. And in many ways, what I've tried to lay out today is a strategic vision for reimagining dual enrollment. But I always remember the wise words of Dr. Rosabeth Moss Cantor. She says, a strategy is never excellent in and of itself. It is shaped, enhanced, or limited by implementation. Top leaders can provide the framework and tools for a team, but the game is won on the playing field. When a strategy looks brilliant, it's because of the quality of execution. I know that it is the work that you will do collectively to execute a new vision in North Carolina that will make dual enrollment even stronger and truly accelerate the success of our students. Each year at our annual dream conference, we highlight our dream student scholars. You met Janae. Uh, we ask them to share with us among other things, a quote that inspires them. Clifton Trawick from Western Technical College in Wisconsin is a 2021 dream scholar. And he chose this quote from Malcolm X. Education is the passport to the future for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for today. Education was the passport to my future. It's why I do what I do. And I'm sure that power of purpose resonates with all of you as well. It's not inherently a passport unless we collectively design it and nurture it and hold ourselves accountable to ensure it. Dual enrollment is so much more powerful when it is more than a driver of enrollments for a college, but when it is genuinely designed to change the trajectory of a student's life the economic and social mobility of our students. So I go back to Janae, two years ago, two, two days ago, I saw a note on her LinkedIn profile that she completed her bachelor's degree at Franklin University in human resources management and business administration. I've stayed in touch with Janae and, and, and uh, I was just so pleased to, to see that and quickly offered her a note of congratulations. Her education is offering her a passport to the future, a passport that will support her continued growth in her role at Columbus State Community College as a talent acquisition recruiter and in her life uh, will also influence her family the multi-generational impact of our work can't be uh, underestimated. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be part of this conversation and to kick off uh, the convening. And I hope some of the comments I've shared uh, have offered you uh, some calls to wonder questions. I'm, and I'm happy to move to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stout. Um, I believe Michelle is having some technical issues at the moment. So at this point, if anyone has any questions, please place them in the chat next to the live stream and um, we will read those out for Dr. Stout to answer. So go ahead and place your questions there and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Now there's a bit of a streaming delay for us. So while you're entering your questions, we just want to remind you um, to fill out the surveys for all of our um, sessions that we have, that um, all sessions will be recorded and will be available for 90 days on our website. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties at any point, please see our help tab for information about how to contact us. So, so far we're seeing some, some comments that, um, that this is helpful and people are thanking you. And thank you for the rejuvenation, Natalie is saying. 
but we always get rejuvenation from our students. So, uh, you know, if there's ever a time when you need renewal, think about those student stories and they will definitely inspire you. Callie says she's excited to move toward helping students in, in way, helping our students that may be excluded and that we need better ways to collect data. Um, let's see, Jonica is saying this, this conversation is impactful um, for community college institutions to offer dual enrollment in separate capacities across different units. How does one lower, in a lower role, consult leadership about a realignment? Are you open um, with strength and dismantling? How are you opening with strength and dismantling silos? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the, what I have found in the redesign of just about any of our systems at our colleges is that uh, we need to be better culture. We need to have better cultures inside our organizations to lift up the voices of those that are doing the frontline work in the field that have the most touches with the students with the high school counselors and others, because you're, you identify those barriers uh, pretty quickly. You, you see them. I started my career as an admissions advisor doing high school recruitment. Uh, I, 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 I can just give a, a, some, some tips uh, because I, I, I understand the, the, the challenge. I think articulating uh, regularly uh, the, the challenges and barriers you're seeing on the ground to your supervisor is important. Uh, I also see uh, dual enrollment often organized in a way that it is siloed. Um, I talk about this with our Gateway to College program um, leaders, that if Gateway is, is not part of the larger structure of the student affairs unit and blended into the student success strategy of the institution, it's very hard for gateway leaders to get a seat at the table. I see the same thing happening uh, with dual enrollment where there's not a strategic perspective that the college holds on how dual enrollment is an accelerator of equitable student outcomes. So it's very difficult if you don't have that seat at the table or that strategic lens within your organization to put your voice to work. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't uh, be articulating what you're seeing and being persistent about articulating what you're seeing and trying to get your students in places on campus to articulate what they're seeing as well. Sometimes the student voice is heard by uh, deans and upper leaders in our colleges uh, more readily than, than the voices of uh, those leading these programs. Thank you. Um, Tim is asking, can you say more about national data and what may be on the horizon with iPads? If, I, I think there is an understanding that we need to think about definitions like first time ever in college, uh, which um, the way the current definitions work are excluding many dual enrollment students from, from the, the data set. And then we don't have an understanding of how their pathways connect into our colleges. Uh, so I definitely see some strategic thinking going to that. It's very difficult, I think, federally to create uh, uniform definitions for dual enrollment when dual enrollment differs so much by state. So there has to be a lot of work uh, done to, to really clearly define what we mean by a dual enrollment student. Um, case in point, is a gateway to college student who's earning high school credit and college credit at the same time on a college campus, how is that student classified in the current IPEDS um, definitions? So those, those are, are the types of things that I think we're seeing the conversations move to, and it's good that, uh, that we're having those conversations now. Thank you. Um, can you talk about what strategies and messaging can appease parents and districts wanting pathways to four-year colleges while we grow our support of students who need workforce pathways? I think it, this, that, that really requires thinking about getting the employer voice into the conversation, speaking from employers who are the colleagues of the parents, speaking to the workforce gaps, speaking to the wage issues, uh, that, that these workforce pathways are going to lead potentially to stronger wages um, and stronger wages over a lifetime than some of the more traditional transfer pathways. 
So I really do think that the moment is to, is to bring parent peers who are employers into this conversation in a stronger way. And that's one way, but this is a, you know, a constant continuing chronic challenge. It's been a challenge for, for 20, 25 years. Uh, there are some creative opportunities uh, that many of our colleges are engaged in, and, and some of it includes uh, the employers sponsoring dual enrollment students and you know, really making a commitment uh, to, pulling, to pulling them through uh, the dual enrollment pipeline. And when parents see that type of commitment, financial and professional mentoring, uh, that starts to break down some of the barriers around the traditional four-year pathway thinking. Great, thank you. And what community college academic support systems are you seeing to be successful in helping students succeed? Ah, uh, you know, there are so, there, we, this is so contextual um, and really is dependent on the design of the dual enrollment program and what the program pathway, what the program pathway is. You know, I, I think I mentioned that there is a lot of design happening where colleges are uh, creating learn, learning communities, cohorting dual enrollment students, uh, tutoring, matching up and tutoring supports, uh, you know, making sure that there, there are student success navigators that reach dual enrollment students, not just students who are first time in the pipeline at the community college, but going, but considering those dual enrollment students as in the pipeline. So we're seeing a lot of um, colleges think about those student navigators and matching those student navigators with dual enrollment students. So they have that individualized, personalized coaching. Our Gateway to College program does a great job uh, with that, uh, that personalized piece of coaching. It's all about helping these students see, uh, gain a, a different sense of identity and identity uh, of, of success. Great, thank you. Um, Laura is asking, how important is awareness of these programs? Uh, we know that we have hundreds of transfer articulation agreements between our community colleges in four years, but there's no centralized place to research them. Wow. So I, I think that, you know, I, I shared some of the work from Indian River State College, and uh, one of the big issues was awareness of the programs and, you know, then building a strategy around awareness of the program. So there's no doubt that there is a significant issue about awareness. Uh, and, you know, if you think about it, a first generation high school, college high school student, parents didn't go to college, don't understand college jargon and college structure, are going to be definitely less aware of, of the programs and, and less aware of the, of the right questions to ask to get access to the information about the programs, if, if that makes sense. And then you add on top of that the complexity of the way that we uh, arrange our information for students to, to go to your own website, try to plot out. Davis Jenkins at CCRC has used this exercise multiple times. Try to plot out a transfer pathway using your website from your community college to a neighboring university. You won't be able to do it. Try to plot out what your degree program should look like and your, what your gen ed requirements are. Some of us, it's so... Uh, so difficult. So the simplification is so important. Uh, we cannot share everything and expect anything of significance to land for, for these dual enrollment students who don't understand college. Uh, I had a, a, a really interesting quote, Let's see if I can, I took it out of my remarks, but it's from a student who wrote about his new student orientation. Let me see if I can find it real quick, because I think it points to this issue of, of jargon. Oh, so here, this is what uh, Andrew Martinez wrote about his new student orientation memories. Quote, when some financial aid form wasn't filled out correctly, and you were told to go to the registrar's office to handle your bursar bill because your registration is on hold, but you don't know what a registrar bursar or registration hold are, you begin to feel like you're not ready. So take that one description from Andrew and think about the way that we organize all of our programs, transfer articulation agreements, et cetera. Uh, nearly impossible for anybody to, to sort through them. It's a big issue for our colleges. Thank you so much. I believe we're out of time. So thank you, Dr. Stout, for speaking with us today. And thank you all for your wonderful questions. 
We hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.